Good morning, everybody. Five and a half years ago, I was hit by a Melbourne tram. I wasn't in a car or on a bike. I just walked right in front of it. Now, I'd like to start by recommending that you really don't try this because it hurts a lot. Did you know that a Melbourne tram weighs to the equivalent of 30 rhinos? So it's like being trampled on by a horde of angry rhinos, and it really feels that way. So it was, it was Halloween 2009, and it was a stormy, dark, wintry night. And in my haste to get out of the bad weather, I passed behind one tram straight into the path of another. So after being diagnosed, I found that I had three fractures in my cervical spine in my neck, which was pretty scary stuff. I mean, I'd always thought that firstly being hit by a tram would probably result in some kind of brain injury, but also that having fractures in your neck would result in paralysis at the very least. But as you can see, that didn't happen. And after 12 weeks in a halothoracic brace, I actually ended up with no resulting trauma, apart from a slight personality defect. But some would say that was there anyway. So. so two thoughts remain with me from this incident. The first is that because I was distracted and through circumstance, I just didn't look for the tram. But what if I couldn't have seen it? What if I had no choice? That would make me incredibly vulnerable in everyday life. But secondly, I didn't suffer any lasting trauma. I was really very lucky. This isn't the case for many people who have accidents like this every day. They do suffer paralysis, they do lose limbs. And through brain injury, they can also lose their senses, such as their vision. This is incredibly scary. In 2007, the American Foundation for the Blind conducted a survey. And this found that Americans fear vision loss more than they fear life-threatening diseases such as cancer, HIV AIDS, heart disease, and stroke. So just think about that for a minute. They fear losing their vision more than cancer. And their main fear that's associated with this is the lack of an ability to live independently. There are over 30 million people with incurable blindness around the world today. So clearly, this is a healthcare issue that needs to be high on our priorities. Now, there have been efforts to restore vision and to address vision loss for centuries now. Way back in the 12th century, the spectacles were invented, which is still obviously incredibly important to us today. Leaping forward to the 15th century, the glass eye was, was invented. Now, although this doesn't restore functional vision, Importantly, what it does is give the people that need it confidence to still engage in their communities. Leaping forward again to the mid-20th century, and Fred Hollows devised a surgical method for removing cataracts and implanting intraocular lenses. And this has restored vision to over a million people around the world in developing regions. In the present day, we have gene therapies and stem cell therapies being developed for very specific diseases. But alongside all of these developments, there have been efforts to develop devices to replace damaged parts of the visual pathway. And this is where the field of medical bionics becomes very important. Okay, so for anybody who's my age or older, as soon as you say bionics, you think Steve Austin. You think six million dollar man, superhuman powers fighting evil, bionic limbs, bionic eyes, ears, the whole lot. Unfortunately, this isn't the reality of medical bionics today. But what med medical bionics can offer is to interface electronic systems with the human body to restore functionality where that functionality has been lost through either trauma or disease. And there are devices that are already in use today around the world. And one example is the cochlear hearing implant. This was developed right here in Melbourne over 30 years ago by Professor Graham Clark and his team. And since that's reached the clinic, it's restored hearing in over 300,000 people around the world. So we have a wonderful base right here in Melbourne to build upon, to draw from that knowledge, and to apply it to the restoration of other senses, such as vision and the development of the bionic eye. And that's happening at the moment. But before I launch into how the bionic eye works, I'd like to just describe to you how a healthy visual pathway works. And this really begins when light from our environment hits the retina in the eye. And the retinal cells convert this light into electrical impulses 
that travel along the optic nerve in the brain through to the primary visual cortex that sits right at the back of the brain. And this is where conscious vision is produced. So we actually see from our brains, not from our eyes. Now, imagine that there's been damage to part of that visual pathway. Those impulses no longer reach the visual cortex. And so that results in either vision impairment or blindness. So what bionic eyes aim to do is to provide stimulation artificially to parts of the visual pathway so that we can still provide vision to people that have lost it. And most bionic eye devices have some common features. So they all have a camera that replaces the, the eye or the retina that captures images from our environment. They all have some kind of computer system that processes the data from that camera to make it usable by the rest of the device. And they all have an implantable element. And this is where the, there are differences in approach. So there are many groups working on developing implants that go into the retina and into the eye itself. There are also groups working on implants that go into the optic nerve. But if the damage to those areas is so severe that it, it's not a viable approach, then we need to implant into the brain and into where conscious vision is actually produced. Now, this concept of electrically stimulating in the visual cortex has been around since the early 20th century. And it was found that stimulating in the brain produces these flashes of light in the visual field. These are called phosphenes. But doing something like this in a clinical environment doesn't really help those people around us with blindness. So over subsequent decades, there was many efforts by groups around the world to make this into a practical solution for people with blindness. And in the early 2000s, a researcher called William DeBell implanted a number of people with incurable blindness with a brain implant. And amazingly, many of these people actually did have some sense of vision produced from the use of this device. But it did have some limitations. So even as recently as 2000, our knowledge in electronics and wireless systems and our ability to manufacture those systems was much more limited than it is today. So DeBell's implant actually included wires that came from inside the skull in the brain through the skull to the surface of the head. And the users of his device had to wear a socket that was implanted on the surface of their head into which the computer was plugged so that it could be stimulated. Now, clearly, this wasn't really ideal. People didn't really want to walk around with a socket on their head. But in the last 10 to 15 years, we've made such advances in electronics knowledge and manufacturing capabilities, and really largely due to consumer electronics such as mobile phones, that we're now able to take this knowledge from DeBell and from his predecessors, and also from the developments of Cochlear, and use it to produce something that is much more user-friendly, that is safer, and that can be used by all those people with blindness around the world. And this is what the group that I work for, the Monash Vision Group, is aiming to do, to develop a wireless, direct-to-brain bionic eye. So as I've already described, the, the device begins with a camera that captures our environment. Signals from that camera are then sent to a vision processor. Now, the important thing about this processor, which is about the size of a smartphone, is that it houses sophisticated software algorithms that process the camera data to make the best use of it for the person using the implant. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a few minutes. That processed data is then sent through a wireless coil that sits on the back of the head through to electronics that have been implanted into the brain. These are about the size of a human fingernail. And those electronics are housed within what we call implant tiles. Each implant tile has its own wireless receiver to receive the information from the outside world. It, it has the electronics, and it also has 43 hair-thin electrodes that penetrate into the brain tissue and stimulate the brain to produce these flashes of light. Now, we know from previous studies that the more electrodes that we implant, the better the vision is that we can provide. And that's because for every electrode that's implanted, one flash of light is produced. So this wireless system enables us to optimize the number of electrodes we can put in each person's brain, and they're therefore giving them the best vision possible 
um, in their own circumstances. But what is the nature of the vision that we produce? I mean, it's clearly not going to be X-ray Steve Austin style bionic vision. But I want to take you now on a little bit of a journey that will hopefully help you to understand just what an impact this kind of vision can have on somebody with blindness. So please can I ask everybody just for a few seconds to close your eyes. All right, everybody's eyes are closed. Now imagine that there's an emergency and you need to leave the building. You need to leave it quickly, safely. You also need to navigate through the tens of people that are sitting around you. Make sure that you don't trample on them, they don't trample on you. Just think about how difficult a task that would be. Even think about making your way to the bathroom and not tripping over the person that's sitting next to you. It's actually quite a challenging task. Now, open your eyes, and what I'm going to do is show you the nature of vision that we think we'll provide and just see whether you can figure out what's happening here. So as you can see, it's very limited information. It'll be black and white. It's very basic, there's no clutter. But I think it's actually fairly easy to see what's happening. Can I have a show of hands for everybody that thinks they know what was going on in the video? Ah, oh, amazing. All right, so everybody has bionic vision. That's probably at least 75% of the audience. But I mean, that's a fairly kind of contrived situation. You've got somebody coming in front and waving at you and walking across, across your path. So I'd like to show you a little bit more of a complex situation and see if you can understand what's happening here. So this is about the amount of information that we think we'll provide with our device. So we had a person at the beginning, but now we've got other objects in front of us. Not entirely sure what they might be. What's really important is that the brain learns to interpret these signals as, as it gets used to them, so that the brain actually gets better at knowing what it's seeing. But this is a bit more complex. It's very basic, but compared to somebody that doesn't have any vision at all, it's actually a huge amount of information that allows somebody to navigate their environment. How many people think they know what was happening in that situation? Okay, so a lot fewer, only a few people in the audience think they know. I'll now show you the full video so that you can see what was going on. So this is Y. Howley, who's our software algorithm developer. And look, this is an everyday situation. It's still pretty simple. It's a brick breakfast table. Probably lots of you um, were looking at this in your homes this morning. Um, a cup of tea that might be hot. You might not want to... to spill it and burn yourself, but really quite a simple environment. And what we've done here with the algorithms is actually get rid of all the unnecessary information and just pull out the edges of the objects that are in front of us. And in this way, we can just provide the really important information to the device and to the person using it so that they get the best use. So how do we go about achieving something like this? I mean, we know that as few as 11 phosphenes, 11 flashes of light in somebody's field, visual field, can have a huge impact on, on their, their everyday life. From groups around the world developing this kind of technology, we know that 11 phosphenes allow somebody to navigate their way to work. It allows them to re-enter the workforce where they couldn't have done so previously because they can see movement and they can engage in their community much more easily. So this has an absolutely incredible impact on their lives. But it's not something that can be done easily. It can't be done by one person alone. It takes a whole team of experts across a number of different disciplines, all working openly and collaboratively for one common goal, which is to restore vision to people with incurable blindness. This isn't something that can be achieved overnight either. Bionic eye devices have now been in development for well over 50 years. And we're getting there, but we'll never have a one-size-fits-all outcome. And that's okay, because with every development that occurs and with every new researcher that starts working on this, we get one step closer to bringing a solution to millions of people around the world.
Thank you.